This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. All right, as promised, here's the, this question that came to us from a viewer in uh, Glendale, Arizona. They write, I'm having trouble understanding how Jesus could be so cold and lacking in compassion when seeing someone in need in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Can you tell me what's going on in this passage? Yeah, uh, you've got to... Some, somebody, somebody sharp. They spent some time really reading, and they're, they're seeing something here that appears to be a little bit disconcerting. Yeah, and uh, without... Oh... Without sounding judgmental about the question, is you, you, you can't come, you can't jump to a, con a conclusion when you study the Bible. Yeah, that's uh, some people. The only exercise they get is by jumping to conclusions. Um, this person is not necessarily falling into that category. <laughs> However, yeah, if you just read it at first blush, you might say, I, I, I'm. I don't like the way that he dealt with that. But let me suggest to you that it, whenever we study the Bible, what we have to do is we have to put aside our preconceived notions and ideas and conclusions and all that and take another look at it. And in, in this context, it illustrates vividly for us how when we study the Bible, we must always understand what's going on in in the Bible context. Uh, it, it demands of us that we have some knowledge about the, the context of the Bible, the context of the time. And uh, the only way that you can acquire that is to study the Bible. And so what, what our questioner has asked me to do is explain this particular passage, and I'm going to have to do a little bit of background in a I'm also going to have to make some assumptions about what you know about that background in order for you to understand this. First thing we need to do, though, is read the passage in Matthew 15, beginning in verse 21. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from the region came out and began to cry out, saying, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he said, and he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. As always, let me encourage you when you read anything in any of the three parallel accounts of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, try to find if that same story is repeated in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Uh, some stories are also found in John, but John is not parallel to, uh, to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But try to find the parallel passage and read the explanation, read the story there. Oftentimes there are additional interesting details that are revealed. What we assume from what all of the parallel passages say, and, and uh, this story is also found in Mark chapter 7. I want to read from it in just a minute also. What, what we assume is that when Jesus crosses over into the region of, the, of Tyre and Sidon, that this is probably the first time that he ever actually goes into Gentile territory. And uh, what the record says is not that he actually went into Tyre and Sidon, but that he went into the, to the district uh, of Tyre and Sidon. If you're coming up to, to Prescott from, um, from Phoenix 
a long time before you get into into uh, downtown Prescott. You come into the city limits of Prescott. That's that's what the Bible has reference to when it talks about the district, the outlying spaces. And in this case, in this case, this is probably the only time that he's on Gentile soil in his public ministry. And and I find in the context that this is, this is really an interesting occasion when that occurs because just previous to this in the context of, of Matthew's gospel, he's dealing with the sanctimonious and self-righteous Pharisees who, who uh, believe that because of their relationship to God as, as Jews, they have a special and, and a set-apart relationship that's more significant than anybody else in the world. And, and immediately following that, uh, Jesus goes into Gentile territory as if, to, as, as if by example, just to, to prove to them how wrong that they are and uh, to teach not only the Jews who would have known of that um, traveling in the Gentile ter- territory, but also the Jewish disciples who, uh, as you know in your study, I hope, of the New Testament, uh, did not always have these things ferreted out properly either, who sometimes, let's take Peter for an example, sometimes was not able to clearly see in his own mind that uh, God loves Jew and Gentile, the Jewish nation and all other nations equally, and that Christ's work was for both Jew and Gentile. Now, it's true that he was sent to the lost house of Israel and that their work was initially among Jews. In fact, that's the specific instruction that Jesus gives to his disciples. And here he is confronted with a Canaanite woman. And um, these, again, to to know the background... The Canaanites were the original inhabitants of the of uh, Palestine, and the Phoenicians were descendants from them, um, going all the way back to Genesis chapter t- uh, ten and verse fifteen and following. Uh, we learn about uh, those relationships. We're not sure because the text doesn't say, and the parallel passage in Mark doesn't tell us how. This woman knew about Jesus' presence there, but uh, assuming some things from what we know of other accounts, it, it seems that wherever Jesus went, people uh, people were were warned or told, or uh, they knew about his coming into their region well in advance of his party and his entourage getting there, uh, for for many many reasons, uh, for the healings that he provided. Um, Sometimes people came out for the food that was there, uh, at the meals that were provided. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is an example of that. And sometimes they came out uh, to, to actually hear him teach or to see if they could catch him in his teaching. Mark records that when this woman comes out, she, feels, uh, she, she falls at his feet. Matthew says that he does not say a word to her initially. And and I think that's probably why our questioner thinks that there's some there's a coldness to here uh to to him here. Uh, One writer that I took a look at said this is he referred to this as the silence of love. And certainly from what we see at the end of the story, someone could um, could say that it's the silence of love. He doesn't deal initially with uh, with her verbally. He knows what he's going to do, and and he knows what's going to be accomplished in all of this. He the silence of Jesus is not indifference. It's for the purpose of teaching a lesson, not only to the woman but to all of those who are observing these circumstances. And I don't believe, as some have concluded, the disciples really wanted to send her away without addressing her, her uh, concern here. What, what seems to be the situation is that she was really attracting a lot of attention uh, with her cries and her behavior, the kind of attention that the disciples were, they always seemed, Danny, to be just a little bit uncomfortable if things didn't go the way that they had it planned out in their in their mind's eye. 
you remember the occasion when the, the little children came mm -hmm. running up to Jesus and the disciples, not because they lacked sympathy or compassion for children, but that, that just wasn't, Jesus got lots of important stuff to yeah. do. and Not, not protocol. And, and Yeah, it's not the proper <laughs> protocol they're thinking in their mind. And, and I think that's what we have here is we've got a woman who's, who's really uh, verbally saying, help me, help me. And, and, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where somebody's acting out publicly, but it does, it's kind of embarrassing, just a little bit uncomfortable. And, and then Jesus is just totally silent. Well, my conclusion is that it was because he knew what was going to happen, and it was to further illustrate the point that he's going to make here in just a minute. And he starts by with his silence to this annoying circumstance to the disciples by saying, I was sent only to the lost house of Israel, which is exactly what he says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. And it's, it's not, again, I, I want to say it's not because he wasn't going to answer the woman's position, uh, petition. It, it is because he wants his, his disciples to understand his purpose is not to meet these demands initially. His purpose is to turn the hearts of those who had the, the most information about God and his plan and his Messiah back to God. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist's work was to, to lay that highway so that when, when those who had the most information about how God deals with man and his Messiah turned to him, then the news of that Messiah could be spread throughout the world, and all of those who had a great deal of information could share that information with the rest of the world. And um, um, she bows before him and begins to beg him, and Jesus says something here that through the ages has been uh, misinterpreted, I believe, taken out of its context, misapplied. He says, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Well, sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? Uh, I, if, if I'm not aware of the way that he's using the phrase here, I might say he's comparing this woman to the dogs. The Jews had a, had a, a view of those who were not Jews as less than humane. They considered them to be dogs, uh, rather base in nature, uneducated, unenlightened, not very smart, not very useful. That's not really what he's doing. Look at this analogy here. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. What he's doing is illustrating what even to this day we, some of us who have dogs, know happens at the dinner table. Now, I don't have a dog in my house. Uh, and that's not because I, I don't like dogs. In fact, I like dogs. But I, I remember when uh, we had a little dog in our house, <laughs> and we would sit down to eat, and where was the little dog? There's Scruffy right there. The little dog <laughs> is right there. And the reason the little dog is right there in houses where this goes on is because the little dog knows that he's going to get a little something, especially when Dad is looking the other way. Dad says, don't feed the dog at the table. The little kids are doing this underneath the table. They're handing the little dog the little, the, the little morsels. And what you can't see in the English that is so apparent in the, in the Greek is the way that this phrase is being used here. Um, I'm going, let's, let's look at one verse in Mark 7, verse 27, which illustrates this. He was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she answers him in a most remarkable way. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. What Jesus is doing is suggesting the order that is found in, in the home, and it is to, to this day, that, that first the children are fed and, and then... And then the dogs are fed. The, the pets are fed. And what she does is she takes the, the little dogs and the little children and she, in a very clever way, turns that saying right back to Jesus. You see, she's not offended by his statement so much as she wants to use 
his statement to accomplish her purpose, which is, after all, to get healing here. What she does is she says the, the little children get the little crumbs from the little dogs. The little dogs get fed after the little children, Jesus said. Ah, she says, but remember, even the little dogs get the little crumbs from the little children. And Jesus was illustrating then to his disciples that she's right. She is exactly right. Even though our purpose in our ministry to spread the gospel initially is going to be among the Jews, mm -hmm. don't ever get the idea that God is not concerned about the Gentiles. And uh, that, that the use of the diminutive here in the Greek is really interesting. She accepts the Lord's evaluation of uh, this situation but pleads only that she fare as well as the little dogs would in a household where there are children. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of lessons I think that are really important for us to understand as we understand the context here when we come back in just a minute. One of the lessons I think that is suggested to, here that is really important is what we know about that happens after the death of Christ after the establishment of the church uh, among the Jews, as the apostles, particularly noticeable as the apostle Paul, as he goes into the Gentile regions, when the Jews reject the gospel, the gospel is going to be taken to the Gentiles. I see that in the context here so clearly. The sanctimonious, self-righteous Pharisees are rejecting Jesus' teaching, and the next thing you see him in, in Gentile territory having this very interesting encounter with a Gentile woman. Another, uh, another lesson that I think just jumps out at me is uh, uh, you need to persevere in your faith. Um, even when you think that you've hit a roadblock, even when, you, when you're convinced that, uh, that things aren't going your way and that uh, the difficulties that you're encountering uh, God has an address for you. You've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and you haven't seen an answer. Don't give up. It, it may be that the waiting is for your benefit and the benefit of others who observe you and your patience as you're going through those things. And you know that God is going to answer. You faithful Christians know that God is going to answer. Keep praying in faith. Luke 18 verses 1 through 8. Keep striving for what you feel is right. Keep pleading your case before God. And in the final outcome, even if it doesn't occur, you know, Danny, when I, when I have struggles, I want an answer. And I want it now. Now. And I always think I know what is best. And I, I've got it in my mind how it ought to be arranged. And when it doesn't happen that way, I'm disappointed. But I don't give up. I, I continue, and that's what I think this helps to illustrate so vividly. She just didn't give up. She was out there. She's making her presence known. Some of the very religious people there, some of the best people on earth at that time, were a little disturbed with it. She also knew the value of a crumb. Yeah. She, and she had faith that God would answer. Indeed. Even when it didn't appear initially like he would. Tune in next week for... What do the scriptures say? See you next time. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.